And yeah, so I'm gonna get started. So uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. Uh, hopefully you can. Yep, I see a lot of thumbs up. Okay, awesome. Um, and so while this is going on, if any of you have questions, um, you know, I want I don't want this to be like super formal. Uh, you know, if you have questions, just please uh, you feel free to unmute and ask uh, or pop them into the chat. Uh, I won't necessarily notice that as well in the chat. Sometimes it's kind of hard to see. Um, but yeah. So uh, thank you again for joining. Uh, this is part of you know the CU Data Week, uh, which will be going on this week. Uh, we're all very excited to have you here. So uh, just kind of an overview of how uh, Data Week's going. Um, today we had basic statistics using R earlier. Uh, you know, hopefully you guys got to attend that talk. Uh, I'm going to be doing creating cool figures in R. Uh, hopefully it's informative. Uh, you know, my goal is that you'll all be able to uh, get something out of this. Uh, I think, you know, maybe there's different proficiency levels in using R, uh, you know, maybe you've never used it, maybe you feel pretty advanced, but I hope that everyone can get something out of this talk. Uh, and I'm going to post into the chat right now, the, uh, the GitHub link. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll type it out real quick. For some reason, Zoom does not like copy paste. Oh, Lala, thankfully she just, uh, so yes, the GitHub link. Um, so if you're interested in, you know, playing around with the code as I go through this on your own, um, you're more than welcome to go here and uh, download it. Uh, you know, if there, you're not comfortable with that, I'm just gonna be going through these examples on my own, you know, whatever you feel uh, most comfortable. But, uh, you know, I think it, if you do go through the code, it's um, some, you know, nice examples that you can modify in your own um, after uh, the session. But yeah, just, you know, you can follow that link and you should be able to access it. And if you can't, um, you know, please let me know and we can kind of uh, figure that out. Um, but yeah, so more about uh, me. Sorry, I haven't really introduced myself. Uh, I'm Wyatt. Uh, I am a research instructor by a statistician for CETA. Uh, I have been here since uh, July of 2021. Uh, and yeah, I'm, you know, really excited to have this uh, talk. I really uh, enjoy creating figures uh, and visualizations. You know, I did it a lot in my grad program and I do it a lot, you know, day to day. I think it's really fun. Um, you know, there's a lot of complexity to it. I'm learning more about it all the time. Um, you know, I'm no, by no means an expert. Uh, so, you know, please, uh, please feel free to ask me questions. Uh, I may not know, but you know, I can, uh, I think hopefully point you in the right direction. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I'll get started with the uh, talk. Yeah, I think, you know, generally you can kind of think of visualization, uh, you know, in three separate ways. Uh, you can kind of think of it as like association. So like how do two things relate to each other? Uh, and you can, you know, think of like a scatter plot, um, you know, X versus Y. That's like probably the most traditional, but you know, there's different, uh, like there's so many different ways of looking at associations. And these are just some, you know, very, very basic examples uh, look at. Uh, there's also like distributions. So if you're just looking at like one, uh, one like variable, like one thing you're interested in, like kind of how does uh, it look like spread out, um, you know, and there's also a lot of different uh, ways to visualize that too. Like histograms uh, are very common, very helpful. Um, you can use density plots and I'll be going over, uh, you know, all these. And then you can have um, just kind of purely descriptive, um, which is, you know, more like what's like the average, what's uh, the percent for, you know, all these different uh, things you're interested in. Um, and it's like maybe a little simpler, but those are also very, um, very powerful, very useful. Like I make those honestly uh, more than any other plots. Uh, and, you know, bar plot is a very easy, handy go-to for those. Uh, so within R, and R is, you know, uh, Kind of a statistical software, uh, it's important to kind of uh, think about the data that you're going to be using to create these visuals. Uh, and R has uh, kind of a handful of different ways that it uh, treats data. Um, and this this part isn't like uh, super duper important um, 
to uh, remember, except for uh, when you're using some functions, the data type does matter. Um, so the you know common types are matrix, um, a data frame, which is usually preferable. Uh, it usually goes into most of these uh, these functions pretty easily. You can also have tibbles, which is like a data frame, um, but slightly different. But just uh, it's it's good to know when you're doing a lot of this visualization, like what uh, format is your data in, because I've run into many, many uh, scenarios where it breaks uh, because I don't have the correct uh, data format. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, it's also important to know like when you're making these visualizations, like what are the variable types, um, because that like some functions uh, will not work if it's not the correct type. Uh, and so broadly, you just kind of have like categorical, which is just like, you know, you can think of it as splitting into like two, three, four, five, you know, categories, um, you know, like, uh, like sex is like a, a, you know, an easy one to like think of, like, you know, you would just have like two, like male and female for the biological sexes. Uh, and then you can also have continuous. So that's, you know, basically like, uh, just like counting numbers, like one, two, three, uh, it can also be like decimals. Uh, but those are just, you know, important to keep in mind too. Uh, the format that you have uh, is also important, uh, not only for uh, visualizations, but just in general, but uh, broadly you can have wide format, which is when like each, if you think of it as like a person is like your, you know, thing of interest. Uh, you can have wide where each row is uh, per subject and like columns for each variable. Like if you have like multiple visits to the doctor, each visit would be its own column. And then you can also have long data, which is kind of the opposite, where it's multiple rows per subject. So each one of those doctor visits, say, would be a row instead of a column. Um, and then two other things to just you know keep in mind uh, with a lot of this is like uh, when you do use these functions, which is kind of the basis of R, uh, what the input syntax is. So like what's what it looks like because it varies from uh, you know function to function, um, and then what's required versus optional. Sometimes you can put in just like the data and that's it. Other times you have to put in other uh, important, uh, you know, calls to the function or it won't work. So just keeping all of those things in mind. And then, you know, what what's kind of the output for this? Um, you know, the output for R, it can kind of differ. You can have it as a PNG, you can have it as a JPEG. Um, you can just, you know, it'll pop up onto your, uh, if you're using R Studio, it'll just pop up into R Studio and you can just copy paste it. Um, but just kind of where your output's going, what it's doing. Uh, and those are all things to just kind of keep in mind. The kind of uh, the, the data set that I'm going to use for a lot of this, it's the Mount Paris data set, which is automatically loaded into R. Uh, and this is just uh, what it looks like generally, you know, it's just cars uh, with, you know, a bunch of information like miles per gallon, et cetera. But just as, you know, so everyone kind of understands like what we'll be uh, making these uh, visuals from. And so I've kind of split the talk into uh, looking at base R, which is kind of the built-in functions. Um, you don't have to add, uh, you don't have to download any extra packages in R and like a package is basically, uh, you know, what allows R to do like a lot of nifty things, um, but base R is just what's already there. You don't have to add anything extra. Uh, and so the general format is just, you know, you use the plot function and you specify your X data and your Y data. Um, you know, for example, if you just want to do a scatter plot, you just do points and then what points you want on the X, what points you want on the Y. Pretty simple. Um, and you can do lines. Uh, Hist is uh, short for histogram. Uh, so the pros of that, I think it's pretty simple to understand and use. Uh, you just need to know which data you're going to use for X, which one you're going to use for Y, or if it's just like a histogram, what, you know, your, what variable you're interested in, what, you know, what data you want to put into it. Uh, the cons is that it's kind of hard to add extra beyond that. It looks pretty clunky, like as far as the code, and it's really like bland, and I'll kind of go over this um, later. Um, so the, the function uh, and like the suite of packages I use, uh, it's called ggplot. Uh, and it's uh, very, very flexible, very nice. I use it all the time. Um, kind of the general syntax is you use the ggplot function and you put in your data, which is uh, this data is short for that. And then you use uh, ace, which is short for aesthetic. And then you put your X and Y. Um, that's the very basic. 
and then you can append it with like what sort of figure you want to create like geo and point would create like a scatter plot uh so you know the pros are that it's very flexible um it's you know you can format it for like all graph types it's like very generalized um you can make a really complex figures that you can reproduce really easily and it's very customizable with the themes kind of like the way it looks uh the cons are that I think it has a higher learning curve, which hopefully by the end of today, like you feel like you understand it more. Uh, and the syntax can be confusing. Uh, I frequently get confused on it still because there's a lot of parts to it, but thankfully Google exists. So I Google things I don't understand all the time. Um, but you know, if you, when you're using it, if you feel, you know, discouraged that you don't remember, don't feel bad. Like I Google things all the time uh, because, you know, there's a lot of information to remember, but it does make it very flexible. Okay, so that's just kind of background. Now we're going to kind of get into what sort of figures you can create and what they can look like. Um, so uh, this is just an example in base R. Uh, I'm just kind of looking at you know miles per gallon, a scatter plot of miles per gallon versus the weight, and I have the code over here. Um, you know, and this is a very very basic plot. Um, you know, you just have your x values, your y values, and then your labels uh, and like your main. Uh, and so again, this is in base R, which I don't use as much, but I think it's very like, if you want to throw together a quick graph, you can just do it like that. Um, you know, it's it's very good for showing uh, some things. So this is the example, like the equivalent plot in ggplot. Um, you know, it's the syntax again is a little more confusing. Um, so if we kind of walk through it line by line, um, ggplot is like the uh, main call. Um, then we have the data set. Uh, mount cars, that's the name of it. Uh, then the aesthetic call, uh, we say that miles per gallon will be on the x-axis and weight will be on the y-axis. And so this is what you start um, every GD plot with, you know, what's your data and then like what, uh, what's going to go to the x-axis and what's going to go to the y-axis if there is a y-axis. Uh, and then after that is when you add your, your next call. So in this uh, specific instance, I use the geom point. So this is basically saying, here's your data, and then here's what I want to it. I want to create a bunch of points. Uh, and then it spreads it out just like before uh, with base R. And then you can add the label call, uh, which, you know, you can say what your title is. And I just did, you know, pretty like a basic descriptive title of, you know, it's a car weight versus mile per gallon. Um, so that's a pretty simple example. Uh, you know, I think between base R and ggplot, they're, you know, about the same. Uh, with these specific plots, they look, you know, roughly similar. Uh, they're not too different. Uh, I'd say that ggplot is a little more, a um, little more difficult to pick up if at least follow like what's going on because of the syntax. But like the important thing to remember is that the ggplot function is basically how you're loading your data in, and you're saying this is what my x and this is what my y will be, and then you do uh, a plus to like add on the next portion. And in this specific instance, it is the geo point, and so. When you add on other things, you'll just do a plus sign, and you know your final function that you call to it, you won't add a plus sign. Um, so then this is uh, a slightly more you know descriptive uh, plot in base R. Um, you know, I think if you look at the code, you can see that there's kind of a lot going on. Uh, you know, I color coded it by number of gears. It's the same plot otherwise. Um, but just adding uh, all that information is a lot. And then if you want to add a legend, that's its own separate aspect. Um, so again, it just uh, ends up being kind of unwieldy when you start adding on more aspects in base R. Uh, so this is the example in ggplot, uh, pretty similar. Uh, so the only difference is from before. Uh, now uh, I've added this color call into the original ggplot uh, function. And so this is just basically saying like, I want to color code it. Um, what do I want to color code it by? Uh, so in this case, we would color code it by gears, um, which we can see over here. And it automatically creates this legend um, for you. So it'll just say, if they have three gears, you know, they are red. If they have four gears, they're green. Uh, so then next, this is just kind of like loading in the data, like I said before. So then we're adding next kind of the, uh, like what sort of figure we want to create, which would be, you know, a scatter plot, which we'd use geo and point for. Uh, and I added in kind of an extra little thing uh, to this. I also added in, well, what about like differences based on the size uh, of the carburetor? <laughs> uh, so kind of getting a little more tricky in advance. And this is just to kind of like doing the equivalent in base R would be a lot harder um, and take a lot more time. 
So I just wanted to include this to just be like, yeah, like you can add this extra layer of information. So this is saying like, you know, if it's a big circle, they've got eight carburetors. So you kind of get this like uh, multi-dimensional uh, information uh, going on in this figure. Uh, like before, if you want to add a title, you do this plus labs, which is short for like labels. Uh, and so before a title is, you know, that's telling what the title will be. Color is saying like, if you use this color call, what should we name the legend? So uh, I said gear number and then size again, it's like, if you're using the size call, uh, what would you name it? And it'd be carburetor. So again, just to kind of recap, like you can add this color call, like COL, uh, and that'll just color code uh, your, in this instance, points, but whatever your visualization type you're using, it'll color code it. And then you can use the size call and it'll also do it by the size um, of whatever you put in there. So that's kind of a comparison of base R and ggplot. And that's kind of why uh, I prefer ggplot. Um, and certainly it's not the only option. There are other uh, ways of doing visualizations that aren't just ggplot, but a lot of them have a similar syntax I found. So you know, once you get comfortable with one, you can be pretty comfortable with a lot of others. But um, I'm gonna move on to some other, you know, uh, figures that you can create in ggplot. Uh, does anyone have any questions thus far, any comments? Okay, well, I will move on then. Uh, so yeah, uh, next, I think, you know, it's pretty handy to make histograms and ggplot is really, you know, they're really fast, they're really easy. Uh, so for this specific example, you know, I'm just looking at the kind of distribution of miles per gallon. Uh, you know, that'll be a theme with a lot of these figures, just looking at miles per gallon. Uh, and so, you know, before we use the geom point, um, but this time we're using the geom histogram. And most of these different visualization types, they're just geom underscore, and then what you want to look at. Um, we'll go over more of them as we go on. But uh, so within the geom histogram, um, you have, you know, calls that are pretty similar to the geom point, but that aren't totally same. So for this specific one, um, we've loaded our data. We're looking at just miles per gallon. And then we're saying we want to look at a histogram of it. And then in that histogram, we're going to look at uh, basically the bins is telling them how many bins we want. And I just said 10. You could, you could split it up however you wanted. You could do 20. You could do five. But it would just basically, that's how many uh, like bars that you get on the histogram. Um, then I said like the fill of those histograms, I'll just do light blue, you know, because I like blue, um, you know, but for the fill, you can just specify color. Um, ggplot is pretty good at intaking like most colors. You could do purple, green, you know, uh, if you want to get really fancy, you can look up the hexadecimals for colors and put them in. Uh, I don't do that all the time because it's uh, a lot more work than need be, but if you're looking for a specific color, you can definitely do that. Uh, and then this uh, the call color, that call call, sorry, uh, before that specified like the color of the points, but with histogram, since we're filling in the, uh, like the bar, the color just does like the outline. Um, and then again, you know, we have labels, title equals this. Uh, so pretty fast. I think, you know, I think this figure looks pretty nice. Um, it's, you know, pretty basic though. Let's see, I have something in the chat. Um, yeah, so shall we said in the syntax, ggplot data ace xy, what does ace stand for? Yeah, so uh, I believe AES, it's just short for aesthetic. So it's basically saying like in this upcoming plot, um, like what are the aesthetic values gonna be? Like what's the x gonna be? What's the y gonna be? And then what are additional ones like um, what like the color would be or the uh, fill or the shape or the size? So basically it's just like, you say what the data is, and then the aesthetic is like, what, uh, how are we gonna kind of like say what is gonna be what in the upcoming plot? Uh, that's, that's kind of how I think of it. Um, you know, you, you always have to put the X and Y inside the, the AES call, um, otherwise it uh, will not work. So if you tried to do like ggplot data and then just X, Y, like what your X and Y variables would be, you wouldn't get anything. So like in this, this uh, histogram, if I just took out, um, oh, sorry. If I just took out the AES and just did like X equals miles per gallon, it would not work. So that's like an important thing. Like you always have to fill in the AES call at the very beginning. Did that, uh, did that answer your question? Okay. 
Um, so yeah, I will move on. Uh, so yeah, so this is um, basically the same uh, information, but I wanted to uh, kind of show uh, another important aspect of ggplot, which is called faceting. So, you know, say you want to look at miles per gallon, but then you want to split it up by cylinders. Um, you can use this really uh, easy, nifty uh, function called facet grid. There's also facet wrap. They're basically the same thing. Um, and so all you do is you pick the variable that you kind of want to split the part, like the plot uh, part by. So it's like, I want to look at cylinder number. Uh, and you'll just do a period, you'll do the tilde, and then you'll do the variable that you kind of want to split up. So for this specific figure, um, I'm looking at miles per gallon split up by cylinder number. So, you know, maybe you're interested, like maybe four cylinders gets better miles per gallon. Like, I want to look at that. Like a pretty fast and easy way. You can use this facet grid uh, function to just split up your plot really easily. Uh, you don't have to, you know, like kind of color code it uh, by like cylinder type. You can just like pull them apart really quick. Um, and then you'll be able to see, you can compare. You know, I think we can see that, you know, if you have four cylinders, you're probably going to get better uh, miles per gallon. Uh, you know, if you've got eight cylinders, it looks like it's going to be a lot, a uh, lot less. So that's, uh, you know, I think that's informative, it's uh, it's very quick and fast. Um, the important thing when you're doing this call is to make sure uh, you do a period and then the tilde and then the, you know, the variable you wanna split it up by. You can do it to level. So if I wanted to look at carburetor number versus cylinder, you could do that and you would do carburetor tilde cylinder, but those can get pretty, messy. We can go over some examples of those later. I can just play around in the code if you guys have any, like, can it do this? What about this? Um, but facet grid is great. I use it all the time. And facet wrap is similar. I think it just alternates like the way that they split them. Like one's like horizontal, one's vertical. Uh, yeah. And so then this uh, is another really, so this is the same graph again, except this time I added in another element of information. So this time I filled uh, in uh, by the number of carburetors. So if you kind of think back to before when I did like color for the geom point, this time uh, since again, like I just think of it as like you're filling in these bars rather than just coloring them, you fill in by the variable. So same, uh, same general like information split by the cylinders, you know, miles per gallon, but now we're coloring in by the carburetor. number. So like maybe you think a specific carburetor uh, size will have better or worse miles per gallon. Uh, I don't see like a specific um, pattern per se, maybe having like less carburetors leads to more miles per gallon, but that seems to be, you know, it's a little unclear. Um, you know, it's, you can create these multi-level plots that have a lot of information in them by using uh, a facet grid and then the fill. And so fill is specific to, uh, you know, basically plots that you're filling something in. I kind of, you know, like, I think maybe, I don't know if anyone ever played like in Microsoft, uh, like paint when they were younger, but like you'd use like the fill in versus like the drawing around the lines. I always think of fill as you're just filling in the figure you created and then colors, just like the outlines, uh, you know, if that helps. But if, you know, if you don't specify it correctly, that's fine. It just might look a little weird. Like if you did color instead of fill, it would just color the outlines of the histograms, which doesn't look quite as nice, but you can change it. Um, and so another thing in this is I use position equals dodge. So that way they are not stacked on top of each other because the default is that they stack. And if you want to see how like they compare, you can use dodge. Um, and you can also use identity. So they end up overlapping, but that doesn't look as nice uh, all the time. So then here's just um, kind of a basic bar plot. Um, you know, let's just like, what's the overall proportions of cars by the gear type? Um, so it's geom bar rather than geom histogram. It's pretty similar. Um, you know, the only difference is with geom bar, you're inputting your, uh, you know, in your AES call, you're doing like, what do I want on the x-axis? But then when you do the geom bar call, you have to specify it again, what you want to be for the y value. Otherwise, it, it would just default to account, um, which is fine if that's what you're interested in. If you want to change it to the proportion, you can do this call where it's y equals dot dot, P-R-O-P dot dot. Um, 
And when you do that, you know, you'll get these basically the proportion of the overall by like whatever you specify in the X uh, value at the very beginning. Uh, and then within this, you know, the same call, like I filled it red, orange, yellow, uh, you could pick it whatever colors for the fill. And then again, I made the color black uh, on the outside, uh, just because otherwise, I think it doesn't color it in uh, at all, which I don't think looks quite as nice. Um, that's personal preference though. Uh, so you see, after all that, I have this other call called geom text. So that's why uh, you're getting these uh, percent or these proportion values on the top of each bar. So geom text is like, it's uh, similar to geom point, but instead of just a point, it's just gonna add text. And so you can just do geom text. You have that AES call again. And for this one, since it's a little different, it's geom text, your label is gonna be what you call it. So like, what do you want? The, the actual text to be. So for this, uh, I just did the you know proportion. Um, you guys don't have to worry too much. Just like whatever you want it to be labeled, just do label equals that. Um, and then the Y is like, where do I want it to go? So again, I'm just saying Y equals proportion. So I'm basically creating this text that is the proportion and then I'm putting it right on top of the bar plot. Um, and that's this is something that, you know, I think a lot of, uh, people enjoy seeing, like they can see the actual percent uh, or proportion, you know, or the percent or count or whatever you use um, with this genome text. And that can be like, instead of creating a table with it, you can include it in the figure, which can be very handy and informative. Uh, and so then these last two calls that you see at the bottom, this scale Y continuous, I'm just shrinking the Y axis a little because otherwise it goes pretty far and it's a lot of blank space, um, which, you know, isn't as, uh, appealing visually. And then again, I have that labs title, which is just telling me the title. Um, so this one is uh, kind of uh, a tricky one. Uh, what I did was create this bar plot. Um, and I the first, uh, first portion of this, it's not super important, kind of this uh, from here. Oh, sorry. So from like here down to here, this is just me like structuring the data. It's not super important. But I basically created um, a bar plot of the uh, z-score for each miles per gallon and just looked at like how far from the basically the average is each car. Uh, so you know if we just look at the figure, we can see that Toyota Corollas have you know great miles per gallon um, compared to the average. And if you're driving a Cadillac Fleetwood, you're getting really, really bad miles per gallon. Um, well, I think this figure, it shows you that you can do um, a lot of stuff with just the geom bar. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, flexibility um, to it, but it also has kind of the same general syntax we've seen before. You start off with your GG plot call. You start off with your AES, you know, what do you want on the x-axis? You want the car name. What do you want on the y? You want the miles per gallon. And then like, what do you want the label to be? Uh, then you get the geom bar. Uh, everything's, you know, basically the same. It's just like, what is the like outcome you want? You want the identities. Uh, how wide do you want it to be? You know, like these are things that you can fiddle with to see how it looks, but like the general syntax is about the same. Uh, so this scale fill manual, this lets you manually input the color types you want and the labels form. So I said like above average, below average. And then this, uh, is the hexadecimals that I mentioned before. So these are the hexadecimal colors. And it's not super important uh, for you guys to like try and figure out hexadecimals if you're not interested in it. You can just do literally like you could do red and green or you know, blue and you know, yellow, whatever you know is easiest for you. Um, yeah, everything else is uh, basically the same. Uh, this little part at the bottom coordinate flip, it just flips it. So uh, now the X is the Y and the Y is the X. You could switch it at the very beginning in the GG plot call if you wanted, or you can switch it at the end to make it, you know, a little easier. It just is personal preference. Oh. So yeah, so this is, uh, you know, another example of a sort of distribution plot that we could do. It's a density plot. It's very similar to a histogram, but it's slightly different. Uh, I like doing density plots because you can fill them in and overlap them a lot uh, more easily. But so for just this general example, it's very similar to, you know, geom histogram that we saw before, except we had now have geom density. And one thing that was added was this alpha call. So alpha basically, when you call it in these functions, it makes it more transparent. 
Um, so an alpha of one means the color, like the fill you use is not transparent at all. But if you use like an alpha of 0.5, it's lighter and more transparent. If you use like an alpha of 0.25, it's even lighter. Um, if you use zero, it would just be totally clear. And not much point for that, but. So this is an example of when we have overlapping with uh, genome density. Uh, and so you can kind of see like, you know, when we have miles per gallon, if we want to kind of look at eight cylinder cars versus cars that are four and six cylinder, and then within those like the carburetor numbers, we can do that um, pretty easily with genome density. So everything, you know, is similar to what we've seen before. We have GG plot where we're loading the data. You know, we have mount cars. We're looking on the x-axis through miles per gallon. We want to like fill in the middle of these uh, by the carburetor number. Um, then we call genome density, and we say we want it to be slightly transparent, not totally. Uh, so this next part, this facet grid, uh, I tried to uh, add in like a little, a little layer of complexity. Before we just saw it was just you know facet grid and then cylinder and all this stuff wasn't here. Well, this time I made it. We're faceting it by whether the cylinder is greater than six or less than six. So that's why we have this split right here, and the stuff after that, that labeler equals call. That's basically like relabeling it. Uh, so it's four and six cylinder and eight cylinder. Otherwise, you would just have true and false at the top for the text, which isn't very helpful if you don't know what it was split up by. And then we have that labs call again, where we have the fill is the legend uh, title telling you the color for the carburetors, and then just the general title. So yeah, uh, this is like another another plot that I like to use. Um, I kind of use it in lieu of a uh, box plot, although you, it's functionally very similar to a box plot. This is a violin plot. Uh, you know, very similar, um, you know, syntax. You know, we have ggplot, we have the data, we have the AES call. So for this, you need like an X and a Y. Um, so for this, I just was like, what's the displacement uh, of these cars by gear type? Um, you know, and then we're filling by gear type just to add some color. Um, and then you use the geom violin call. Uh, and if you wanted to sub this out for like geom box plot, um, you would just use that. It would be a very similar figure. But you know, this is like another like uh, nice, handy, quick visual to just kind of display like what do the distributions, uh, you know, of these, uh, you know, thing variables of interest look like. And then you can kind of split it apart by like another level. You can split it like your type. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, just, same syntax. Uh, once you kind of get the hang of it, you can be really flexible and use it in a lot of different ways. Uh, so here's, um, you know, I like a lot of people like uh, I think like to kind of do uh, time trend analysis, and uh, you know this is one way of visualizing, you know, trends. Uh, this is a different data set. Uh, this is a, a different way of like, or a, a way of visualizing, you know, trends over time. So this is just some uh, European stock market data. Uh, and so what we have is just like how these, uh, you know, different uh, stock indexes in Europe, how they're changing, their closing prices, how they're changing over time, you know, so it's very, um, you know, it's very similar to Geom Point, um, except in this case, I'm just using Geom Line, which, you know, connects it in a line. Um, you know, we've got the AES call where I put the uh, time on the x-axis, the so y is the closing price, and I just colored it uh, by the, you know, different uh, stock index. And yeah, you know, it's, it's very similar to what we've seen before, uh, but I think it's a very, uh, very nice visual that, you know, you can apply in like a lot of different, uh, you know, contexts. Uh, so this is uh, a similar, like the, the same, uh, information. However, um, instead of just being separate lines, this is using geom area. So now it's uh, basically ordering them by their size and like stacking them. So now, you know, we can kind of see like once like they're all on top of each other, like what's like the overall, uh, you know, closing price. And then it also splits them out by uh, the specific index. So you can kind of see like the relative size for each index. And so it's, you know, again, it's basically the same uh, same overall code, uh, you know, you just use a different call, you use geom area. And I think, you know, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, not to like hammer home the point, but I hope like thus far it's clear, like you use the same syntax um, for like a lot of these figures, but 
The nice thing is you can just change one call, like the geom underscore, and you get radically different figures, which you know can be very nice uh, when you want to look at things in different ways. So this is a uh, this is a fun plot that I haven't used a ton. Uh, so this is uh, called like an alluvial plot. So this basically uh, tells you like you know you have these uh, discrete categories like how do uh, people how do groups change within these categories. Uh, so this is like a somewhat morbid plot. Uh, you know it's kind of survival on the Titanic by the uh, class. You know like what class on the boat they were for a second, third, or crew, and the sex. Uh, and so you can see, you know, like if we start off with first class, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the first class passengers were male. It's like color coded red, uh, and then a lot of those male passengers did not survive, uh, you know, the trip, uh, unfortunately. Uh, or if we go over to crew, we can see that again a lot of the crew uh, they're in purple that they did not that they were male, and then again a lot of the crew did not survive. The trip. Uh, so, you know, this, this is just one example. You can, you know, you can make this in many different ways. Um, but we can see that the, uh, the call is slightly different, um, but also very similar. We have the GG plot. We load in the Titanic data. Uh, then we specify the AES. So, like in this case, the frequency uh, would be on the Y. And then for this specific um, function, you have multiple axes. So, like axis one would be uh, whether they survived or not. Axis two is uh, their sex, and then axis three is class. So basically, that's going to tell like which one they're going in between, uh, and you can reorder those however you want, like the variables. But like it's just telling how many axes you want to do, and uh, you can do you know you can do two, three, four. Uh, I'm not sure what the upper limit is. Uh, probably not a ton because that would be a lot of information. Um, and then this geom alluvium is you know equivalent to like the geom. Uh, point uh, that we've seen before, you know, it's like, what are we filling these um, by? And that uh, is basically the kind of the middle portion we see, which uh, is like the movement. This is the geom alluvium. And then uh, the geom stratum uh, is like an extra one we add. And that's just basically these uh, strata. But, you know, it's very similar to all the other uh, ways of looking at it. And then we have, you know, again, we have geom text, uh, you know, that we add to these stratums. So it's it's similar to when we added geom text to that box plot before, um, not the total, not totally the same. Um, but yeah, you know, I think it's pretty similar, but a very, a very different figure that tells a much different story than, uh, you know, you could try and make out of like just a box plot with this. And then, uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of people use heat maps. Um, this is just another example. Uh, you know, heat map. Uh, can pop up a lot, uh, I think, in like genomics research. Um, and I think it's like handy to just know how to do it. Uh, I've used it several times, but you know, this one again, it's very similar. Um, you know, instead of uh, you just use geom tile. Oh, uh, so sorry, everyone, I did not notice these questions. Uh, okay, so Christina is GG alluvial part of GG plot. I'm getting, oh, yeah, so. GG Alluvial is its own package that you install. It's just called GG Alluvial. Um, sorry about that. I, I'm going to go over my code in a second, and we can kind of go through uh, some examples, and I can add uh, a few things if people are interested. But yeah, it is its own package called uh, GG Alluvial that you have to install. But once you've installed it, it is you know good to go. Uh, so Kevin said, so this is sort of a flow chart in a single graph, right? Is this used in causal inference type studies at all? Uh, you know, I'm not super sure. Uh, I have not used it uh, all that much myself. Uh, I am currently using it uh, in a study that uh, is looking at transition uh, between different states over time, uh, but we're not really uh, looking at the causal inference uh, aspect as much. But I think it definitely could be used uh, in that. You know, that's not my uh, not my area of expertise whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think. You know, I think it could be used uh, just very flexibly uh, and very widely. Uh, I think it's you know a pretty cool uh, plot, and uh, yeah. But so, um, getting back, uh, kind of just this figure, uh, you know, geom tile uh, is the call for like if you're going to try and make a heat map, um, you know, and it just follows like the general same syntax as before. You know, the AES call, and then you're filling. You could color. Uh, Instead, but again, like when you're doing like a 
something you can fill the color with just like do the outline. Uh, and I just, I stressed that point because it took me a long time to catch that, like, or like to like understand the distinction. And I'd always like color things that shouldn't and be like, this looks terrible. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this is kind of the like last plot that I came up with, uh, you know, I thought it was just like more of like an advanced bar plot, uh, you know, but you can split it up, uh, you know, again, using this like facet grid. Oh, sorry, the code is not on here. I think I got cut off. But I use like a facet uh, grid to cut, like uh, separate this. And then, you know, I added in this geome text so you could see the exact percent, uh, you know, but it's kind of uh, using the same tools that you have uh, used for like all the other figures and just building on them like se sequentially. Like I do like a lot of like very simple figures at first, like I'll just be like, here's the very basic uh, outline and then I'll just add on to it. And I think that's why like G ggplot's really nice because of like, if you're going to add on to it, you literally just do this plus symbol that adds on like the next uh, kind of uh, portion of it, like whether it's a label, whether you're splitting it up, whether you're adding text. And so I think it's just very easy to just start off with and you know kind of start slow but then you can just get more and more uh, advanced and create just figures that are really interesting and they can be really powerful, uh, you know, and I don't think, I don't think you need to be like an expert in like R to do that. Uh, Cause once you've kind of got like the general like syntax down, you know, these are like all these data sets are just built in data sets in R that you don't even have to like change. You can just use them straight away. Um, so yeah, uh, this is my last slide, but uh, I'm also, we still have some time and uh, I think it would be helpful uh, if anyone had any questions uh, like, or if they were wondering whether it's possible to do uh, specific things on any of these plots, I will uh, share my R code. Uh, also, so you guys can just see like overall what it looks like. So this is just um, the R code. Like, you know, I think it's, it's easier to see what the code looks like uh, within like the actual uh, software. But this is the R code, um, you know, up here I'm loading these packages. Uh, so I loaded tidyverse because ggplot's within it. And I use a lot of the functions in tidyverse to kind of organize my data. Um, but you could just do ggplot. Um, gg alluvial, is just, it lets you make those alluvial plots. And then um, this one is one that I, I'll go over uh, in a little bit. And then this is just loading the built-in data sets, you know, Mount Car is Titanic, air quality, uh, and then like European stock market. Uh, and then from there, you know, I just made the various figures. But um, does anyone have any questions, like any specific, uh, like, is there anything that you're like, can you do this? Uh, what about this? Because like, I did not, there's a lot of things that you can add that I did not uh, go over in the interest of time, because there's a lot of different, uh, you know, suites uh, and functionality to ggplot. And, you know, we could be here for like ever just going over like, Oh, you can do this and this and this. Uh, can R make a map? Yes. So I personally do not have experience uh, making uh, maps with ggplot, but there is a geome uh, map function. Uh, you can make maps. Uh, I've seen it like done. It's you know very very cool, very nifty. Nifty. The only thing that uh, that is different about that, because obviously like map data is different than you know just normal data. You have to um, essentially uh, specify your data as a map. Um, but yeah, G uh, ggplot can make maps. Uh, they look very cool. Um, I think. Let me see if I can find one online. Uh, Maps. Yeah, I'll just share this. Oh, sorry, I gotta switch screens. Okay. But yeah. Um, you know, this is a couple of versions of doing it. Uh, you know, again, I have not. I've not used it, but you know, I think this is a more basic. Then you can use like Geom Polygon. Uh, there is a Geom Map somewhere. Layered maps. But yeah, you know, uh, you can definitely do it. It's very, very powerful. You know, there's a lot of different functionality to it. Uh, so yeah, and then so Lauren, are force plot capabilities in GDplot? 
Uh, I believe so. Uh, I have not uh, made uh, any forest plots in ggplot, but I uh, I think I've seen them done. Uh, you know, I think you can pretty easily like find examples of them. Uh, and again, like the nice thing about it is like they all follow like the same syntax. So like once you've uh, kind of gotten down like how to do uh, the basics, you can definitely. Uh, here. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So Christina. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. So what? Okay. So Anne said, what do you recommend for paired plots? Um, lines from before to after treatment. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good one, Anne. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of different uh, ways to look at that. Um, you can do geome line, um, which will link, you know, if you have uh, like just treatment, like, you know, before, after, and then your, whatever your outcome would be of why, you can do a uh, geome uh, line, which would just like link those. It'd be like a spaghetti plot, basically. Um, and the, the thing is you would uh, group it. Uh, one, one example that I didn't talk about is in the AES, uh, call, you would use group equals. And if they had participant IDs, you would say group equals participant by participant ID. And then it would link those lines by that. And you'd kind of get like a spaghetti plot. Um, that's like what, uh, you know, you get in like longitudinal like analysis, like they'll use spaghetti plots like that, but you just use like the group equals uh, call. And that would again be in the, a the AES call at the very beginning. Um, so Stephanie said, any tips on the best, easiest way to add confidence intervals showing standard deviation? Yeah, um, so I guess it depends on like what your plot is. Uh, so if you're just doing like a, say like you're just doing a scatter plot and you wanna add like the regression uh, line to it, which like, that's like one thing that you can do uh, very easily. You just use geome smooth and it'll automatically, uh, so you do like geom point and then you do plus geom smooth and it would automatically add regression line with the uh, uh, confidence uh, in it. And if you're doing, uh, say you're doing like uh, like a you know bar plot, uh, you could do, I think it's geom underscore error bar uh, and you could manually specify those or you could just do geom box plot and it's, those are built in too, but yeah. Using, oh, sorry, Stephanie, I did not. Uh, yeah, using geom column. So with geom column, yeah, you would use uh, geom, let me just double check the syntax. Yeah, so it'd be geom underscore error bar. And you'd have to manually add those, uh, like, you know, using the y uh, min and y max values. Yeah. Is there anything else anyone can think of? Or I can I can run through some slightly uh, I'll kind of run through how some of these plots can look a little different. So for one of these histograms, uh, I just added a uh, horizontal line, um, which, you know, I think if you're trying to like identify like what's a cutoff point, uh, you know, or, you know, what's like something that's like uh, clinically significant, like this barrier, uh, you can do like geom H line, which is a horizontal line, or you can do geom V line, which is a vertical line. And then you just specify like, oh, like where do I want to set the intercept? You know, I set it at three because, you know, it worked on this plot. And you can change the line type to be dotted, you know, just a lot of different variety. Um, yeah. Uh, so then what's another one? So one thing I didn't touch on quite as much, uh, you can change the themes uh, very easily. You can uh, so this is, again, this like, uh, this is just a default theme, but this is what the black and white theme looks like. I like using black and white uh, a lot, but there are a lot of different themes. I'll just kind of, so we have classic, dark, uh, get, gray, gray spelled differently, light. Uh, so there's just a lot of different themes that make it look, uh, you know, maybe not substantially different, but I think uh, depending on if you're trying to submit it to like a specific journal or align with a specific uh, format, you can add that theme, which I think they're very, uh, is very cool. Um, let's see, I had one, two others. I modified slightly. Okay, yeah. So one thing that uh, I didn't really go over a ton uh, is uh, like if you're dealing, like if you're interested in creating graphs that uh, anyone can see, uh, 
you know, because, you know, color, they're colorblind, uh, this uh, Veritas package uh, exists. And so all of the colors in the Veritas package are colorblind friendly. Um, it's, uh, I used it for uh, my thesis defense, because, uh, you know, I think, I think they actually just like cool in general. Um, you know, the scale fill Veritas B, that's kind of the, uh, like, that's built into ggplot on its own. And then you can also just download the Veritas plot or Veritas package. And this scale fill Veritas is also in it. Uh, you know, I think they look really nice. It makes the figures uh, accessible for everyone, uh, which I think is cool. Uh, you know, and I think everyone being able to see the figures makes your, you know, whatever you're trying to spread, like, that much easier because, you know, everyone can appreciate it uh, and can appreciate what you're trying to show. Yeah, and then, yeah, I think, I think that's kind of just, you know, uh, what I have in general. Uh, if anyone has any, oh, I see some more questions. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm really bad with no noticing notifications on the chat when I'm sharing. It does not like to pop up. So Christina said, do you recommend a good quick reference that identifies what type, uh, what uh, data visualization for what type of data or statistical test? Um, you know, I'd have to think about that, Christina. Um, you know, I think with uh, a lot of like the more common tests, like if you're doing like a chi-squared test, you know, you are going to be able to get a lot of work out of box plots. Um, if you're doing, you know, like just uh, like a t-test, you're going to be able to get a lot of work out of, you know, comparing two different uh, like histograms. Uh, you know, you can add like, you know, I hope like with what I've shown, like you can add a lot of that information onto your plots pretty easily. Um, but, you know, I think it, it just depends on the analysis. Uh, and I'd have to kind of think about like what, you know, I think you can kind of approach it in a lot of different ways. I don't think there's like one specific visualization for every type of analysis. Um, but like for like, however, for like linear regressions, you can just do like geom point and then geom smooth and that'll give you the exact same. And you can do more than just linear regressions with that geom smooth. You can, you know, you can do like logistic regression uh, and it'll plot it, uh, although it doesn't, doesn't have quite the track record of linear regression um, in my experience. Um, you know, I think there's also a lot of add-ons to ggplot that like will incorporate those analyses into the figures. You just kind of have to go like digging into them. Um, and it's a little, uh... Oh yeah, so the recording, yep. Like Lala said, it'll be posted later. Uh, yeah, can you change the text font and or plot? Yeah, okay, so Kat is uh, asking if you can change the text font. So yes, you can, Kat. Um, so the way you do that, uh, you do themes, uh, theme, sorry. And so, so if you can see all this stuff here, uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, so this is how you change it. So for example, if I wanted to change the axis, the y-axis text. So I do axis text x. So that's saying like the axis on the x, or the text, sorry, the text on the x-axis, a lot of x's going on. Uh, we want to do something to it. So you would do element. So you could do element blank, which would just make it blank. That's sometimes you want that. I'm um, not always. Uh, but element text is what we're going to be more interested in. Uh, so you can do that. And then size equals uh, I think family equals bold. Let's font family. Oh. Face. Face and family. Yeah. So, you know, it's slightly modified. Uh, I think I may need to make the size a lot bigger for it to be substantial. But face equals bold will change it to bold. Um, you can do italic. I think it's italic. No, sorry, it's italic. Again, Google's your friend. Yeah, so you can do italic and it'll make it italicized. I think you can do bold italics. No. There's a bold italics. I'm not sure what the exact call is, but you can make it bold and italic. Uh, but yeah, and you can play around. You can change the font. You know, you can make it Times New Roman, you can make it a, whatever font you can think of. Um, you know, you can, you can change any and all of the text on here. Uh, pretty pretty easily, it's all within this theme uh, call, which is a pretty 
this is like a call that has a lot going on. Uh, but yeah, so that, yeah. Oh yeah, and then the, the background color, uh, sorry, totally. Uh, you can change that with the uh, theme as well. I don't really tend to do that as much. Um, you can change it with, uh, within theme as well. Um, and then you can also use like the theme uh, here, I'll show you. Ooh, nope. So now, you know, the, the background's darker, but yeah, these theme underscores, they'll change the, uh, they'll change that as well. Yeah, uh, I do have, sorry, I do have one more thing that I want everyone to be able to see. Uh, so yeah. Uh, We would really appreciate uh, if you know you guys were to uh, you know we we have a lot of job uh, openings available uh, you know currently at CETA. So if you guys want to you know check us out on LinkedIn and spread those, that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> you know, or check us out on Twitter, that would also be great. But um, thank you all so much um, for you know coming to my talk. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, you know, I. I feel like you can, I'm constantly learning more and more about visualization. So I'm by no means an expert. Um, you know, I think it's, it's very easy to kind of dip your toe into it and get better. So I hope this, you know, give you a little uh, confidence to start doing your own. Uh, and yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, you know, like I'm more than happy to troubleshoot. If you have some figures you're trying to make, uh, you can just reach out to me at my email. Um, but yeah, thank you again uh, for coming.